And the rest of us, let's go ahead and turn back to 1 Thessalonians. I would really hope that everybody in this room today, if I were to ask you what your desire is for our church, I would hope that everyone would want this church to be strong, that we would want the church to be healthy and growing, and, and we would use some words like that, but that brings up like sometimes differences in opinions and definitions on what exactly those words mean. Uh, sometimes people will judge healthiness of a church just based on you know, how big are we getting and whatever we got to do to get there, we got to do it because we got to we, we got to get big numbers. And so, sometimes that's considered uh, a, a sign of, of healthiness. I'll say this growth is not a bad thing. Having numbers is not a bad thing. If a church is standing firm on this book and they're preaching the word of God and they're serious about making disciples, and they're serious about people coming to Jesus Christ, if that's the, the passion of a church, and God is blessing that church with numbers, that's an awesome thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with growth. But if our method of growth is that we use you know, effective marketing strategies in order to give people what they're looking for and to make them happy, that's problematic. My goal, and you've heard this before, my goal is not to make people feel good about themselves. I want you to feel accurate about yourself. I want you to understand what God's word says about us and where we are and what we need to do to be coming in line with this book, not with the culture that's around us. Our goal has got to be to have people looking to this Bible for their answers. That's got to be our passion. And there's a huge difference in those growth strategies. And there's a lot of churches, and I, I've had contact with people recently from different churches, and there's a lot of them that are very concerned with being politically correct, with having people who are following a, a perverse mentality with their sexuality, confused on their gender, all this mess. They just want to make everybody feel good. They want people, they want to accept everyone where they are without having this, this understanding that we don't stay where we are. We need to change. And, I, and I'll, this, this, is, this is not in the notes, and I'll say this, if you're not changing currently, I don't care how long you've been a follower of Jesus, if you are not changing, you're failing. Jesus wants us to continually be transformed to his image. And if I'm not constantly being transformed, if I'm stagnant, I'm, I'm really not stagnant, I'm, I'm going down. We should be constantly changing. And too often, we, we, we don't notice. And it's really a good thing for us to pray and ask God to open our eyes to where we're, we're going down. Ask him to help us to see where we need to change, to be like our Savior. That's one of those prayer requests that God, it is his will. And he honors that. And he will answer that prayer. Because he wants you growing. He wants you getting closer. He does not want Rick Fowler to stay on the same spiritual level where he's at right now. He wants us growing. So we need to remember this. Churches are not getting this too often. Now, my goal is not to make people miserable. I don't want to have you come in and you know, beat up people and be fussing and constant. You know, I, I want to encourage you but I want to call sin, sin. And I want us knowing where it is that we need to change and how it is that we're supposed to respond to an ungodly world that, is, that hates us. Every church has its issues. 
we're no exception. Uh, if you don't think we have issues in this church, just look in the mirror. We've got issues. We all fight against our flesh. We all struggle with what God wants us to do. We've got issues. But some churches, uh, they end up, it, sometimes it's a good, sometimes splitting is good. Sometimes church people will split from a church because they want doctrinal purity and a church is going in a wrong direction. I, I've seen churches do this. I remember hearing one recently, um, you know, the church decided no, we're okay with, with people who choose to lead a deviant lifestyle, being homosexual. We're okay with them just accepting as they are. They can be members. They can, you know, and people said, no, that's unscriptural. We're not having, we're not putting up with this. That was good. That was a good stand. We need to take a stand for the word of God. But too often our splits are more of, uh, they're silly. That is ridiculous splits. I don't like green. Grow up, buttercup. And th this is what we got. You come here. We're not here for the color. People want to get silly and have these, these silly splits. Here's where I'm heading with this. I think there would be a, a, a general consensus among us that we don't want to be this way. We want to be strong. We want to be gospel-centered. We want to do what this book is telling us to do and not put a, a blight on the cause of our Savior. Our desire has got to be to bring glory to our God. And, and I don't care what area of life that is. We are to bring glory to him no matter what. And we need to be serious-minded about our relationship with him. That is exactly what Paul was doing in this book. Paul is passionate. This is a young church. This church, what, he saw people come to Jesus Christ. He saw them enter a relationship with, with Jesus. And by doing that, make peace with the God that we've all offended. They received forgiveness for their sin when they came to Jesus. And then quickly, Paul gets run out of town. And Paul's concerned for these young believers. He wants them to grow. He knows he sent Timothy to talk with them to find out what's going on. And he gave them some answers to their problems in this book. And he's passionate that they be walking with Christ. He uses words, phrases, as you remember that we've been going through here, walk worthy of our Lord. He wants them to live their life in such a way that they are bringing glory to God. And, and he is going to be wrapping up this letter that we've been studying with these last four verses. Sometimes as you read through some of these epistles, you get to the end when he's saying goodbye, so to speak. And we kind of tune out. These last four verses are rich. There's a lot here. This would, it, it would, it's, it's kind of like us knowing he is writing this letter to them. But hear me, he's writing this letter to us. Notice the words. We're going to go back and cover all this. But 25, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren. Verse 27, read this to the holy brethren. And verse 28, Christ be with you, plural, all of you. Okay, I'm going to paraphrase, brethren. He's talking to us. If you're going to say this morning, I'm a follower of Jesus, these four verses are just targeting us this morning. So these are what we need to hear. So my goal for today, as we look, and I'm just going to call this like a postscript, you know, the end of the letter, he throws a little bit more in here. I want us to see some things that Paul thought were important enough to emphasize at the end, to, to bring to their attention, to bring to our attention. And if he felt these were important for them, he feels they're important for us. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at this last bit of our text. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you are concerned that we follow you. Help us to be obedient to you. Help us to have a desire to glorify you in every area of our lives. Lord, I ask as we look at your word this morning, 
would you please help us to to be able to block out the distractions, to be able to block out the cares of this world, to be able to focus on your word. Lord, I ask for your help as I preach. Please keep my words accurate. Help me not to be a distraction to the teaching you desire to have done here today. But above all, Lord, please glorify yourself in some way by our actions here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. First thing I want us to see is, and this is a hard one to preach again, but remember your spiritual leaders. That's what he starts out with in verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. Now, if you remember back when we looked at verse 12, verse 13, he was telling them, you know, get to know those who were leading you. Get to know your spiritual leaders, those who admonish them, esteem them highly in love. And it's easy to preach this if you're at someone else's church and easy to tell them to, you know, love your pastor. You know, here, you know, you've got me right now. So we're going to go through this. Brethren, let's just stop with that word, brethren. That word is the emphatic word in the Greek. And when, that, when he puts a word in the front and he emphasizes this word, it's like he's drawing attention to that word. He's saying, brethren. So if you are here this morning, and you say, I am a follower of Jesus. He's saying, I'm talking to you right now. This verse is for you. None of us is off the hook. Brethren, pray for us. Tense of that word. Pray continually. Never stop. The word there for prayer is to supplicate. This is not the word where we would say, okay, I've got a prayer list and I'm going to check off my list when I pray for this certain thing and I fly through them. I just want to say I've prayed. That's not the, the, the idea that Paul has here. Turn back for just a moment to Romans. Romans chapter 15. Paul expresses a similar idea here. I want you to see the words he uses. Romans Chapter 15, we'll start with verse 30. Romans 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered. Here's what he's concerned about. We'll see this in a moment. That, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe. I can be delivered from unbelievers in Judea. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. So he uses this word here, this very specific for us. He says, strive together with, with us. That word strive has the idea of agonize. This is not a simple prayer list. He's, this, this type of praying that he is saying, believer, do this for us. This one takes effort. This one takes energy. It's difficult. Now, I've had some people who have left the church who have, they've said to me, uh, Pastor, I'm just not getting anything out of your preaching. I have never claimed to be anything special when it comes to talent, when it comes to ability. I've never claimed that. But we just covered in verse 20, of this chapter, despise not prophesying. Despise not. Don't make light of the preaching of the word of God. We should be making it a conscious effort, no matter who we're listening to. As people preach this book, we should be actively looking for what we can receive from our Lord through this book, through that messenger. That is an active process that we have to take. That is on us. And, I, and I, this is a side thing, but if you're depending on what you get this morning to feed you for the rest of the week, you're going to starve. This is not enough. You need to be in this book daily, regularly, meditating on it, thinking on it, rehearsing it in your mind. And that doesn't happen by accident. It's got to be an active process, but people have left because they're saying, you know, I'm not getting truth out of this book, out from your preaching of the book. I read one guy, and, and he's had a, a few really good sayings, Adam Clark, he was from the 1800s. He, I'm paraphrasing a little what he said. 
He said, it's no wonder that people don't benefit from preaching if they're not praying for their pastor. What do you expect? All of us in this room today have a spiritual work that has to be done for us to receive the truth of God's word coming into our hearts. We are to be praying that God would open our minds, that God's, uh, I mean, Aaron had prayed earlier that the spirit of God would have free reign in this room, that we would not allow ourselves to be choking ourselves off with the cares of this world. We need to be actively looking for the truth of God's word. We all have this spiritual work that has to get done. Do we believe this? I'm going to say probably not. And the reason I say that is, how much should we do it? If I really believe something, I will be actively involved in pursuing it. Are we praying that God would be the one to feed us, to grow us, to give us truth? We need to be laboring more in prayer. We need to take it seriously. But he also says, brethren, pray for us. That would be Paul, Silas, Timothy, and we know of those three. I don't think there would have been more, but he's saying pray for this, this leadership team. Pray for the elders of this church. He said they all need it, and they did. We do. So what is it that you're supposed to pray? Help Pastor Ballard not to stutter. Helping to stay on track. No, there's some things that Paul gives us in other epistles. And he says, here's what I want you to pray for me. So we're going to take a few of these. This isn't an all encompassing list, but he gives us a few. Uh, turn over one page, I believe for you, probably Second Thessalonians chapter three. Is where we're heading next in our next book study. He pray, asks for prayer for safety. Chapter three, verse one, finally, brother, and pray for us that the word of the Lord can have free course and be glorified, even it is with you. So pray that we'd be able to give the word of God freely and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So we say pray for our safety. Pray as we give the word of God to those around. We need to pray for that for each other, by the way. We should be involved in this. Pray that the, the word of God would be used freely in the lives of those who don't know him and, and those who do know him. But in this case, for those who don't know him and that we would be delivered from those attacks. He prayed the same thing, the passage you just read in uh, Romans 15, 31. Same exact thing. Pray that we would be delivered from those who are against us. So you can pray for safety. Another one, uh, the Romans 15 passage, again, you don't need to turn back, but wisdom in working with people. Wisdom in working with people. He prayed in that Romans 15 that his service would be accepted, that people would receive his ministry to them with the word of God. So what is Paul dealing with? He's dealing with conflict. He's dealing with people that have barriers. He's dealing with people problems. Does this sound familiar? This is exactly what we're dealing with in the church today. Constant people problems. Constant struggles. People dealing with sin. People dealing with other people. You know what? Pray for wisdom. I don't know how many times people have said, I got a question. I kind of go, uh-oh. Okay, let's do it. You know, I, I don't, I have the answers. But I got to find them and pray for wisdom. I can find them. We need the truths of this book. And it's not always easy to deal with messy problems. So I ask for your prayer for that. Effectiveness, a third one. I know it's not in your notes, but effectiveness in proclaiming the word of God. That would be Ephesians 6, 19, Colossians 4, 2. He said, pray that I have, I'm paraphrasing, the opportunities to speak and that I'd be bold enough to take them. We need this. We need to have wisdom and we need to have boldness. And then the last thing I'll mention here, spiritual strength. Ephesians 6, the, our warfare our warfare is not against flesh and blood. It comes out that way a lot of times, but our main warfare is demonic forces. 
pray for me as your pastor to be victorious in these spiritual battles as I pray for you. Now, you've heard me say this before. I consider it a very negative thing when missionaries report back to churches and are expected to be super Christians. They're expected to show no weakness. They're expected just, here's how God is blessing and we're doing awesome. I get nervous when I hear that because I know they're having problems. I'm having problems. You're having problems. And I can't pray for you effective, as effectively as I would like if I don't know what your problems are. Hence, why we try to have people communicating with us. Can I just suggest to you it's no different with me? I've shared this before. I remember preaching something. I forgot what I was preaching. But I made a statement. And I said, this is one I struggle with. And it was, it was a sin issue that I, you know, I got to be on constant guard. And somebody pulled me aside after and said, you're the pastor. You're not supposed to say that. I didn't realize when I accepted this position that it meant that I got some special level of grace and I don't sin anymore. I need your prayers. I get attacked left and right just like you do. And that's what Paul was telling them. We, you, know, you need to pray for us. Pray that we'll be victorious in our walk with Jesus. We put off the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Nothing stops anyone from being exposed to that temptation. So Paul saying pray for us. Your application statement, don't say a prayer, but intercede with God about your pastor, understanding that God cares and is actively listening to you. It's not in vain, people. It's good to be concerned about the leadership of your church. You should be. This verse is telling us this. But we also need to be concerned about each other. We've got problems. We need encouragement. And that's your second point. We need to develop, to develop relationships among us. Verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Well, let's just start from the beginning. Greet them. This word literally means enfold them in your arms. It means to embrace. It means to genuinely welcome someone. This is not the person who stands at the front door and says, hello, welcome to the church. Hello, hello. That's not what he's talking about. This is a serious greeting. Now, in our culture, our culture, this would be, for me, a warm hug. This is that hearty handshake. Guys do this when you got the handshake, you pull in, you pop on the back a few times. You got to go gentle if it's a woman, I know. But you, you pop them on the back. You give that warm fellowship hug. It's how we show, you know, this is special. But notice that he says another word here, greet all. Greet all. Okay, let me tell you what he's saying there. No partiality. There should be no partiality among us as followers of Jesus. Now, I get it. There are those in this room that you don't naturally mesh with. There are those in this room that may bug you more than others would. You probably bug them too. It doesn't matter. We are to genuinely, openly, intentionally, warmly welcome each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. There should be no, no partiality among us as believers. So if we're to be praying for God to love people, for God, I didn't say that right. 
praying to God for us to love people. Now I said that right. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what I've heard prayed before or heard kind of I mean, what I've had is a bad idea before. You know, I'm going to pray for that person because they get on my nerves. He's got to change them. They are such a pain in the neck. Wrong prayer. That is not what we're to pray. God, would you please bless them? Encourage them. They're struggling with this and this and that. Help them. Let them see you. Let them experience your grace in their lives. Work in them. Help them. Don't. It's not that they need to be changed. It's that you need to be changed. We need to change. We're the ones that need to have the passion to do our part to foster relationships. That's what we're to do here with brothers in Christ. Now, there's some of you in this room, some who aren't here right now. You, you, I get it. You're an introvert. You'd rather be alone. You'd rather go do your own thing. You'd rather, you know, that, that's, just, that's just who you are. I get it. Can I encourage you? you know, read this verse. Just read the verse and ask God to help you obey it without making any excuses. I'm full of excuses on why I don't have to do what I don't like to do. But this doesn't give us any wiggle room. Greet all the brethren, every one of them, and you and I, we are to do this. I've heard some people say, well, you know, I, I get along better with the unsaved than I do the saved. Now, we could jump all over that one for a while, but this verse says, you're to warmly embrace and have fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is to be our closest relationships. No excuses. I did enjoy one quote that I came across this week. Uh, you may have heard a guy named Warren Wiersbe. And he said, he has this statement. I have been in churches where the congregation escaped like rats leaving a sinking ship. Fellowship is part of our worship. This is part of why we come together. We are to come together and so much the more as you see the day approaching with the whole purpose of exhorting one another. You can't do it when you're not here. Just can't. We are not to be these rats that escape out of a ship that fast. I like that last phrase. It was his last phrase. It was good. We should be fellowshipping. Last part of the verse here. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Here's where some people may be squirming. Uh, one of my previous pastors did a missions trip one time and he went over to Russia. And in Russia, they greet one another with a holy kiss, men to men on the lips, women to women on the lips, men and women, you don't do that. But that's what they're, a lot of Eastern cultures still do this. It shocked him. It would shock me. <laughs> I'll practice it with Bethany. That's all I want to do. But that's what they did. Okay, I get that. That's not our culture. Our culture. Hearty handshake, warm hug. You know, we were down, when I was down in Mexico, they would, it was just the women, I think, did this. They touched cheeks and kissed the air off to the side somehow. It's kind of weird, but it's what they do. It's okay. That's what that culture does. Our culture does. Handshake and hug type thing. Do it. Be openly affectionate with those who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Spurgeon said it this way, let brotherly love continue in a hearty friendliness among yourselves. I'm not so concerned how you do it. I'm just I'm concerned that you do it. If we want a healthy church, going back to our initial statement, we won't come and escape like rats getting out of a ship. We will want to build an atmosphere that is home, an atmosphere that is family. That doesn't happen 
by itself. We build that. We we uh, we kind of like force is not the right word, but we we help it along. We've got to participate in that. But please remember this. We shouldn't look for others to be the ones changing. I can't control what you do, but I can sure control what I do. Let's concentrate on us. And let's ask the Lord to give us this genuine affection for the brethren. That's his point in verse 26. Your application statement. Let's ask the Lord to help us to actively strive to increase our love for the brethren in our church. Your third one. Constantly read the word. Verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle, this letter, be read unto all the holy brethren. I think most everyone in this room would agree that the word of God must be an important part of our lives. If, if, if you're not, if you haven't gotten that basic point yet, we got a problem. This is an important thing in our lives. We must be devoted to this book. But look how serious Paul's admonition is here. He says, I charge you. That is not a light word. This is That word is the one where I put you under an oath. We would say it today, you know, swear. You got to swear to this one. He's putting them under an oath. Solemnly urging them. And it's an emphatic command that he's saying here, I'm charging you. And then he intensifies it. I charge you by the Lord. This charge I'm giving you is by the authority of Jesus himself. This is God's will for your life. This is what God wants for you. Now, I'm not sure exactly what Paul was thinking as he was going through this verse. It could have been that I just wrote all this stuff answering the questions that have come up with your church and all of you need to hear this information that I'm sending you. That could be what he's saying. It could be, and I don't know how this works at all. It could be that he understood somehow that God had inspired this letter through that he was writing. Maybe he understood it as he was writing it. And he's saying, you need this book. Could have been both. I would lean towards the third one. Paul knew that what he was writing them, they needed to hear it. Whichever way it is, he is emphatic that this message that he is writing, it needs to be heard by those Thessalonians. This epistle, this letter is to be read, tense of that, over and over and over. They are to continuously, constantly read this book, in this case, this letter. And the wording refers to a public reading. God's word is to have a vital, central role in yours and my corporate worship. This book is to be centered. You don't need to hear me. You don't need to come and hear me give you a whole bunch of nice stories with good morals. And then throw a verse at you to kind of make it spiritual. We need to know what God says. We need to leave here with knowing what God says and doing what God says. So we are to read this book. We are to proclaim this book. We're to say what this book says. We don't need, this got brought up a little while ago. We don't need to use this book to say what we want to say. We need to say what God says. And there's a huge difference there. For us today, my job, my responsibility is to read this book and to exposit to you, explain to you, apply this book to your lives. That's my job. And that's what we all need to be doing as we study this book. We need to take this book extremely seriously. So he says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Why would he say all the holy brethren? 
there's no barriers for who needs this book. Let me just rephrase that. You need this book. There are no exceptions. You need to be in it. You need to be understanding it. You need to be studying it. You need this book. And when it comes to the public reading that he is describing here, for this public reading, you need to be here to be hearing the public reading of this book. That's a good challenge for us. Because back then, they didn't have printing presses. If you wanted a copy of this letter, it was time consuming, it was expensive, it was tough to get this letter. You needed to be there to hear it. You needed to gather together. Why do I bring that up? People were spoiled rotten. Do you know how many people I've seen? I'm, I've done it too, okay? This isn't a bad thing. How many people have pulled up on their phone and thumbed through their Bible this morning? I was doing it. We have totally free access to this book. They didn't. To whom much is given, much shall be required. We've got so many blessings sitting right here at our fingertips. What are we doing with it? Whatever I feel like. Do what makes me feel good. How about do what glorifies my God? How about follow Jesus and seek to know what he has to say to us? We need to take this book extremely seriously. So the question would be, are you taking advantage of what you've got? Or are you taking it for granted? You're doing one of those two. Ask God to help you to be more serious about this book. Your application statement. Make the intake of the word of God a vitally important part of your daily life. So we've seen here just in these, in these three verses, a healthy church is going to be praying. By the way, back up a second. I'm saying a healthy church. You as a part of this church, I, 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 you can't take the, the, the saying, uh, a chain's only as strong as its weakest link. That doesn't apply in a church. We got people all around. We're, we're joined together. It's not just one link. You're not going to you know, collapse the cause of Christ because you're not following him. You'll collapse your own life. But you're not going to collapse the church. Because you choose to be disobedient. But we as a church. And you as an individual. We need to be praying people. Seriously praying. In this case for your leadership. We need to be actively loving the brethren. Fellowshipping together. We need to be reading and studying the word of God. In all areas of our lives. All these things are things that we must do. We must participate in. But we got to remember this last one. We got to rely on God's grace. We've got to rely on God's grace. Verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This gets back to the principle that we've studied. The Philippians 2, 12 and 13. We're told very clearly. Work out your salvation. Exercise your salvation. Verse 13, understanding that it's God that's doing the work. We can do nothing without him. We rely on him, but we're still commanded to do. We're still commanded. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, live in such a way as to please God. We're commanded to walk worthy of our God. We are to participate, understanding we're dependent on him. To work in and through us. We're dependent on his grace. Now he starts out. Chapter 1 verse 1 of this book. Grace be unto you. And he's ending it with grace be. Grace of our Lord be with you. Paul's understanding very clear. They need grace. If the Thessalonians are going to be. Were going to be successful. In walking with Jesus. It would only come as they daily. Rely on their Lord. Not on their vain efforts. Not on doing the best they can. It's relying on Jesus. We need his strength. To be successful. That thing that's true for us. Just like it was for them. 
We need his grace. What is grace? God's unmerited favor to undeserving needy sinners like you and me. We need his grace so bad. The moment we think I'm okay is when you're failing. We need his grace. The grace of our Lord be with you, in the midst of you, among you, accompanying you as you go through life. God's grace needs to be our companion in this Christian walk. And it's not just the one-time occurrence. We talk about people needing the grace of God to come to Jesus for salvation. Yes, we do need his grace. It is by grace. But it doesn't stop there. That's where it starts. We need his grace to continually accompany us to walk in a pleasing way unto God. We need the grace of God to be our lifetime covenant partner. We need his grace. We need God to constantly, continuously intervene in our lives to strengthen us as you and I strive to walk with him. Now I'm making this final statement. It's like Paul, I don't know I'm not sure if he got back to see the Thessalonians. But if he did, it wasn't much. He wasn't able to have tons of input into these people that he loved so much. And so what he's doing is saying, I'm committing you to the grace of God now. I can't do anything else. I mean, God's got to do something if it's going to happen. He knows that they're dependent on Jesus. Isn't that so often what we run into? You look at your children, your grandkids. You can teach all you want. I hope, you can, I hope you're being a good example. I hope you're trying to make little disciples, if you will. There's not so much you can do. You can't change their heart. God's got to do that. You can't draw them to Jesus. God has to do that. All we can do is just keep making introductions. Here he is, here he is, here. And commit them to the grace of our Lord to change them to do the work that needs to be done. We see it in our children. You can look around to those who you're, you may be trying to disciple. As we disciple people, you can just pour your heart into someone. And guess what? If they don't want to follow Jesus, there's not a thing you can do about it. We commit them to the grace of our Lord. You and I should strive, actively strive to do our best to help people. But that's where it stops. We turn them over to the Lord. We trust him to continue the work that we're trying to get going in their lives. It's up to him. And we can trust him for this. Paul was with the Thessalonians. We do that with you. You do that with others. Your application statement. Let's strive with all of our might to walk worthy of our Lord, understanding that we are totally dependent on his grace. So if we want our church to be growing, if we want to be vibrant, it's not going to come because I come up with some marketing strategy. It's not going to happen because, you know, I'm Mr. Personality and can attract people. That's, that's shallow. That is not what we need. Here's a few areas that we should concentrate on. People pray. Pray like you've never prayed before. And I ask for that as Paul did for me. Pray for God to give wisdom. Actively, intentionally love each other. Fellowship with each other. Be serious and passionate about this book. And then let's just entrust others and ourselves to God's care. Let's ask him to help us take advantage of the grace that he's offering. We should be passionate about desiring to walk with him. 
And if that's not with you right now, if you don't have that passion for whatever reason, you need to call on God to give it back to you. Just like David, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. One of the men was sharing with me recently, they, they woke up in the morning and just, just something wasn't right. And they didn't know what. And they just called out to God, help me. And they went back to this book. And God helped them. You need to be passionate about calling on God to help you. And he'll renew that joy in you again. If you've never placed your dependence, your trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross to make peace between you and the God that we have all offended. If you've never put your trust in Jesus alone, that's where you need to start. Doing all these things that we've talked about, that doesn't help you make peace with God. That doesn't give you a relationship with God. It doesn't result in your forgiveness. You need to repent. And you need to turn and call on Jesus as Lord and receive him. I'm so thankful that God has said clearly in his word, he's not desirous that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his desire for our lives. And we'd love to be a help to you. Let's stand for a moment. You've never become a follower of Jesus. Living right won't help you. You need to become his follower. If you'd like to know more about that, please pull us aside. We'd love to help you. We'd love to show you in the word of God how you can make peace with God and have a relationship with him. Christian, let's ask the Lord to help us put these commands into practice. Your willpower is not going to do it. You need, you need to rely on your Lord to give you strength. Obeying his word is part of us walking worthy of him. We need to ask for his strength to do so. You, you, you deal, do business with him now as Bethany Place. Mike, can you close us, please?